Hey guys, Henning and Morton from Flip Normals here. In this video, we are going to be covering the general process for how to make a character. We're going to be going through the steps from concept sculpting, retopology, texturing, and just explain the various steps. It's not going to be so much actually sculpting and painting, it's going to be, going to be more an overview, just so you can have a better understanding of the pipeline, the process, and how everything just fits together. This can be information that's pretty hard to get a hold of for, especially for beginners who haven't been haven't really worked in the industry before. So we get this question a lot. What do I do after this process? Of What about this process? So hopefully this video is going to be helpful to a lot of people starting out have their, that are wondering what what is the, the exact steps that, that goes into producing a full character. Like what is retopology and <laughs> why do I UV map my characters? So yeah. we're just going to be talking about this for some time. Before we get started, we just want to mention that we have a lot of uh, premium tutorials, which is going to support this really well, yeah. such as we have a concept sculpting for film and games, where we actually cover all the steps to how to sculpt this character from start to finish. Then we have uh, how to retopology as a full character, where we actually show the full on retopo for it and the UV mapping. And then we also have one where we do go far more in depth in regards to UV mapping, how to get this ready for a substance painter or mm -hmm. how to get this ready for Mari. Yeah, so this one is just a little more in depth than what's covered in the retopology one, where we also focus on, on something like a UDIM layout, for example. Exactly. So check those out if, uh, if you feel like you want to take your characters to the next level. And with that, let's get into how to actually do characters. Yes. <laughs> So the general steps are for characters is first you sculpt them up. You do a concept sculpt, then you retopologize them. And we're going to get into what that actually means a bit mm. later. And then you paint textures and then you export those out and plug them into a shader in your render software. So those are the steps. So the very first step is concept sculpting. This is from chapter one in our series on how to concept sculpt. And it looks pretty rough. The main steps here is you block it in, you block in the anatomy. We start with a predefined base mesh, just because we can't be bothered to actually <laughs> do that from scratch. Yeah, and that's actually, that's a more common practice than the not. Like, yeah. it's it's very rare, especially in the production, it's very rare that you get to start from nothing, like yeah. a sphere in ZBrush. That, that usually never happens, because unless you're doing a very specific monster concept or something, most things in films are bipedal. Or yeah. maybe they're quadrupedal still, but then they're based off of like uh, the studio's base mesh for a quadruped or for a biped. So most of the time you have something like close to this that already has a has UVs, it has different kinds of UV sets for, for groom, for effects. And these are all the things that would just take you way too long to reproduce again. So yeah. this is why you always, most of the time you're handed a base mesh. Exactly. So in uh, in this case, we, we are using the base mesh, not so much for the topology, but you would definitely do that in certain cases as mm -hmm. well. But it's more so that you have the features. You can see here the hands. It's kind of a pain in the ass to do with C-spheres. <laughs> and if you try yeah. with DynaMesh, everything just kind of webs together. And this is really tricky. So this is just a generic base mesh, nothing fancy. Like you can get them in, uh, if you hit a comma key, you can find tons of them here. You can use Demo Soldier, you know, really yeah, doesn't yeah. matter. It's just so you have a general base, which is facing the right way forward. It's an approximately right scale. It's not upside down and that all also those. That also happens more often yeah. than you would think, like <laughs> people doing like upside down models with facing in the Z direction or something. Yeah, so yeah, they were modeling like this <laughs> yeah. and they're like, hmm. Something is off. Something is off. Yeah, so this just gives you a better starting point than having to start from a sphere, basically. Yeah, so what you can see here is you see some very loose anatomy it's super rough. We're just blocking in the rib cage, just blocking in the clavicles, the skull, the general polys for the for the for the ears. Do some sculptor's pro mode on that. Generally, just getting yeah. the elements you need out. If you if you need wings, you know you get the wings out there. If you some general proportions, so it's gonna look very pretty. And then we refine it more. We're basically the same, the, the exact same base mesh, but where we just you just refine it. Yeah, you're like you're filling in the blanks. Before you saw it was very rough. There was a lot of gaps and things. We had to find the bony landmarks, the muscles, and it's kind of like retopology where you then start to connect things up. Like with retopology, you just have small segments. You connect them all. It's the same thing here. You draw in some lines that define the basic muscles, the basic bones, and then you fill in the blanks. And this is really one of the most important steps of the entire sculpt. Because mm. uh, the difference between this and the final result is, is 
basically refinement and details. Yeah. Your if you were to look at the character from here, and then let's go to the final one, you know, like they're they're very similar. Yeah. So you just gotta you just gotta do this step properly. This is where people rush it the most. They want to get from this level to a more refined level right away, so they start to subdivide it, <laughs> or maybe even from like this level where you know like it's it's just not there. Yeah. You gotta no none of the volumes are there. This is a pure technical exercise basically. So get the volumes right, get the proportions right, to get the character right, and and everything else will follow from here. Yeah. The problem we often see here is that people. People people love details, <laughs> so people tend to rush into detailing way yeah. too quickly, even before their their silhouette or their proportions are really on point yet. So definitely, you want to spend your time. Well, I think I think the majority of your time in on this on this step here. Yeah, we spend so much time on this. I think actually maybe this chapter here might be free on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay. uh, at least one of the, one of the chapters <laughs> yeah, of this yeah, is yeah. free, so you you can definitely check that out. Yeah, it doesn't look good. <laughs> You know, it's stretched like crazy, but you have the character. You can see he's, he has a strong rib cage. You can see he's more of a predator. He's mm. kind of a bad guy. And uh, get the character in here. And then let's see if this is the right one. That is the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> and then we refine it more. You know, you subdivide it. Maybe you turn it into Dynamesh and you just refine it a lot more. You get some of the, um, the mu you get the muscles in. You get the leathery feeling of the skin and um, you refine the anatomy and you just generally work it up. It doesn't matter how you get here. In this case, we've, um, I think we just dynamished it and then subdivided the head once to get more resolution. Yeah. Literally doesn't matter how you get here. If you just subdivide a base like crazy or if you use Sculptor's Pro Dynamesh, if you zero mesh it, whatever, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. The end goal is for you at this stage just to have the shapes. Yeah, you want something that you can then go on to read the Yeah. And whether that's half Sculptor's Pro with some subdivisions, semi dynamesh or whatever, it, does, it doesn't really matter. No, if you have a crazy triangles and not, nothing <laughs> flows, I mean that's what we have here. Yeah. This is this is super this is nasty topology. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. So keep refining and keep refining and keep refining. Get make sure you can see stuff like the shoulder blades. Can't stress how important this is for sculpting. Get the shoulder blades in there, get the bony landmarks in, get the hips in there. Basically everything we did in the first chapter, where you know it's super rough, that's where it comes out now. You uh, you know you get the kneecaps you get all these bony landmarks if you didn't get these in in this stage then you know you're then it's never gonna look good yeah especially once you start adding smaller muscles and you know skin detail once that gets added it's really hard to backtrack it's yes. really hard to figure out you know if you if if you want to place the quadriceps on the thighs but you don't have your kneecap in there and you don't have the you know the two porosities on either side of the leg. It's like, wh wh where does it connect? Where does it terminate and where does it insert? That, That's one of the questions that's really hard to answer if you don't get down your bony landmarks to start with. We keep we keep saying this in basically all our sculpting videos that you know you got to just take your time and that's because it's so true. Yeah. The difference between this and, and this is, is, is basically proportion and refinement. Yeah. The bony landmarks, they're all the same. Yeah. They're the time we spent on the first chapters and the first hours of this, really, they come back with interest right now. And then, uh, you know, you just keep refining everything. You go over everything. You, you go this close and you just keep refining this area. You go this close. And this is where you can focus more on details. Mm -hmm. And details doesn't necessarily mean high poly stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're adding tons of pores or you subdivide to 10 million polys. But more that, you know, you get in different plane changes and you can squeeze in a lot of, of details like you know this could be you have a little spike here on his collarbone and what and just these small little things they don't necessarily require 10 million polygons but it's just refinement it's something just to make it more interesting and uh, then you go through all the other pieces as well such as you know, teeth eyes you gotta make sure you have all these pieces because people tend to forget them, they, <laughs> they sculpt this really ferocious predator, and then they, uh, they, uh, it doesn't look right at the end. But yeah, you forgot your teeth. Yeah, you can't do so that. It's, it's like we talked about. Um, <laughs> we released a face sculpting video, <laughs> and we always keep talking about when we do these face sculpts that people tend to forget eyebrows mm. on people. 
which is which is interesting because you're so focused on well, I just want to get the face right that you tend to forget one of the major things that we use for expression. Yeah, um, it's the same thing when doing creatures like this. Forget the teeth and eyes, and you know you have nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you just have you know like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old old creature. Yeah, exactly. Which is totally fine uh, if you want to do that. Same when you know eyes as well. If you remove them, there is just so much less character right away. Yeah. So this st- what's important this stage as well this isn't necessarily to make it production ready. I've uh, I've talked to students who um, run their concept scope and they're trying to make their arms completely straight and you know the fingers here have some bend in them and this is fine at this stage because you want to get the character into it. For the production model, you don't really want to have a gesture and you wanna you want to make mm-hmm. it easy for rigging. But at this stage. You, you haven't signed off on a model yet. If you're doing your student film or whatever it is you're doing, it it doesn't it doesn't really matter if it's ready for production yet. You're trying to figure out the design for it. It's kind of like if you're drawing a character and you don't care if you're drawing it in t pose. You just want to draw the character where you can see, you know, the character. Yeah. So if you if you pose them up or whatever and you don't have perfect symmetry, you know, that's totally fine. Just know that you gotta fix that later on as well. So, spend a lot of time on this. This is where the creativity comes. If you if you go into retopo at this point, we, we we will explain what that means in a bit. If you go into <laughs> retopo and you're gonna be and you think you're gonna keep refining the design, you're like, oh yeah, I'll just add the fingernails in in retopo and I'll add the teeth in retopo and all that. Technically, you can do that, but you really really want to make sure you have them blocked in, because. This is where you sign off your design. This is if you if you're in a in a movie production, the director will basically see this, and then the director will just see the the character in the shot. They don't care at all about the technical parts. So sign off on the design at this point, which it's so important. Include all the parts, like the claws, teeth, hair, fur, whatever it might be. So whenever you're done with that, that's when we start to retopo. The reason you got a retopo is basically if you want to move this character he particularly if you look at the at the face it's too heavy you can't you can't actually deform this character at all because it's it's far too heavy so if you want to actually rig this character up and you want to, particularly if you want to have it in a in a high functional rig if you were to get this character here which is a few million polys you know it would it would crash yeah no animator would be able to use it and no rigger would be able to like skin it or anything no so what you want is you want a low res base which the animators can uh, can use in the rig and then you want a high res version which can be rendered. So the retopology simply means you get topology which are just these grid lines on top and now you're just redoing that in something like Maya or basically any software can do it today. Yeah. Wh- whatever gets you it's kind of like um in the beginning of ZBrush, you just want to get the shape in there and any form of retopology software, whatever it is, yeah. you know. There is no special s- software, which you have some which are specialized, like uh, Topogon or something. Topogon 3D Coat is a bit more, but it yeah. really doesn't matter. Like topology is topology and you just got to get it from, from whatever source you can. So we have now taken our model into Maya. And this is this is basically the start of the retopology series we talked about in the beginning. Yeah. We we straighten out the fingers so that you can there's less gesture in them, less interest, but you can make one finger and copy them. For rigging purposes, you probably want to keep this a bit straighter as well. The hand has a bit too much of an angle for it, but you know whatever works. We were never going to rig this character. Yeah. And we now need to start blocking it out, and that looks like this. This is what we talked about in the beginning as well, in terms of it's the same with the sculpting. You just simply want uh, the lowest res base possible where you don't, it's like you don't get distracted with details yet. Yeah. It's kind of like inputting or like getting in the bony landmarks and the, the major muscle groups. You do the same thing with retopology, where you just make sure you define the biggest features and you sort of like you loop around them. And this way makes it a lot easier for you to connect them up later on. One of the common issues we've seen a lot is people tend to, just like with sculpting, go into too much detail too quickly. Yeah. And the problem with that is that now you have to make everything the same level of detail in order to connect it up. Whereas if you start out with a low-res base like this, 
it's not really an issue connecting up different pieces because you can just add a loop or take away a loop here and there and it doesn't really affect the rest of of your topology yeah so important to start so you can see here the way we're doing it is it's very simple yeah. you know we, it's literally just blocking in the loops and this is uh this is one of the most important parts of the entire topology process because this is where you you're really defining redefining where stuff is going if you if you start going people just keep doing this they keep starting with a quad like this at this stage and now you just keep doing this then you are in so much trouble <laughs> because you can't redirect this. This is far, far too too uh, detailed. It's very hard to, to redirect anything. And it will also just take you a lot longer. <laughs> the, the nice thing about doing the lowers approach is that once you have something that looks pretty decent, but doesn't quite support all of the detail yet, you can simply go in and then you can just subdivide it. Yeah. That means that you have a lower risk base for the animators and the riggers to use, and you have a higher risk base that you can then use for rendering, that you can take into ZBrush, which is where you'll maybe extract your displacement maps from. So doing this low res approach, it's just, it's better for you and it's better for everyone in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, once you once you start, if you start down on that path where you go high res to start with because you want to get all the wrinkles into topology from the very beginning, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot and you might not regret it for the first couple of days after you've done one arm. <laughs> But uh, after a while, you're, you're going to start to see that your life is going to be very miserable yeah. very, very quickly. Redopoly is pretty fast if you're doing it this way. You can already see just me dicking around a bit here. Yeah. It's how quickly you can just start blocking stuff in. It's very simple. The way you do it in Maya is just using Quadra. We aren't going to get too much into the technical aspects because no, no. we have uh, we have a bunch of free videos as well on our channel going through exactly this. But this is generally the approach. You're modeling with very low, low res polygons on top of this. And then, uh, you know, you're just blocking it in one polygon at a time. <laughs> uh, and then uh, let's just hide this. And uh, go into layers and hide this. And then you block it out more. You get something which is more refined and you connect some stuff up. Hands still pinning us. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what Morton mentioned in the beginning that you often use a pre-made base for this. For in production, I probably wouldn't read topologize this character. I'll probably just use the pre-made base mm -hmm. and then use a tool like Wrap3 for it. Yeah, Wrap3 is amazing. It means that you can just take uh, your predefined mesh, select some points, select the point for the shoulder, the fingers, the face, and it's going to wrap it to it. With magic. With probably with Russian magic. magic. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it's just magic. <laughs> I saw that tools coming up for ZBrush now as well. Yes. So I'm very excited about that. It's going to be amazing. So here you can see as well, just more refined. You have the hands in there. We have uh, we have we have most things in here now for for the body. We're still missing stuff like the inside of the mouth. You still have to get something in there, even if you aren't really going to see it. Same with the inside of the of the eyes as well. You just want to make your model watertight. Yeah, uh, which just means no no open holes like this. And whenever we're working, we're working without symmetry and just doing one side and mirroring it over. You can technically do a lot of this with symmetry, and in a certain software, like you might be able to just do everything with symmetry. I still would do it without, just because um, th then you there is no point really. Yeah. And uh, you know you just it's just uh, half the performance. Yeah. And th this can get quite heavy. So. Um, yeah, I mean sometimes you have to, you run into the issue where you actually have to split off part of your model yeah. to re-apologize it properly. That might just be Maya being shitty. Yeah. <laughs> other software might be better for that yeah whenever i'm doing a retopen maya I, I have to do that yeah. this model is uh it's one mesh but for the tutorial we're actually split it into the the bottom part which is separated out at the hips and top part and you can even do the head as well because maya has performance issues when it comes to retopology yeah. which is annoying i personally use moda for most of my retopology just because the performance is pretty good the tools are just as good as Maya. Yeah. But I know other tools as well, like Blender as well, also, which is, you know, completely free to use. Yeah. Is also great for modeling and retopology. And then once you are done with that step, then you know you mirror it over and then you you add it, you add in teeth to it, the tongue, all the extra parts, making sure you have production ready eyes and uh, generally just good topology. That's again the thing with the eyes. Usually Usually eyes will be in the base mesh you're using yeah. in production, so most of the time you won't be making your own eyes. Yeah. Unless it's something very specialized for, you know, some kind of strange creature, then yeah. you might go in and tweak it. But most of the time, you'll have like a studio default eye. Yeah. But if uh, you don't, 
we we show you how to do this in the full series yeah. as well. It's very simple. You, you just have a sphere, <laughs> and then uh, you, you have two parts. You have the inside and the outer part. The outer part is has a glass shader basically, and the inside has. Let me show you what this looks like. Oh no, this will make life. <laughs> there you go. So it looks like this. Yeah, and then you texture this part. So this this part, nice. This ha also will, ha will get the UVs as well. It's important that you UV map your characters, which will look like this. This is uh, this is a UDIM layout. This is a bit more complicated than what you might be doing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. This simply means that each one of these tiles is one texture map. So this is a 2K map, 1K map, 4K, whatever it might be. It's just one texture map. The problem we're trying to solve with UDIMs is if you need more resolution on your character, let's say you get this close up to the character. Now you have the problem if everything is in one map that you just can't get close enough. If, if this is a 2K map, a 4K map, there is no way in hell that you can be able to get this close without <laughs> no. without problems. So then then what you're thinking is, well, I can make the, the texture part, I can make this bigger. Yeah, but then something else has to get smaller. Yeah. Or you can just increase the size of the map but now you might end up with like a 64k map, which is which is insane. No which... software on earth can load that. <laughs> so UDIMS is basically a way to solve that. This works only with Mari though. If you're using Substance Painter, you cannot currently do this. If uh, you're watching this from the future and algorithmic have indeed fixed done, this. Done magic. Then... And now we're gonna get comments saying like, no, no, no. Painter totally supports UDIM, but what they don't support is painting across multiple UDIMs, yeah. and that's the issue. So when you're working on something like, let's say you do the face and you have the neck, and you want to paint across to have no seams in there, that's going to get very tricky. Yeah, um, they are they are working towards it seems like a, a full full implementation of a UDIM um, workflow. So that's going to be awesome once that comes out. I but, very much like that. Yeah, but uh, but as of now. This is something we would probably only recommend that you would do in Mari. Yeah, it, it, it basically is something you would pretty much only need if you need high resolutions for a character. If you're doing a mid, mid level character or mid frequency character, then you probably aren't going to need UDIMS. The cool thing about uh, painting in 3D though, we'll get to this in a little bit, um, is, is that you don't have to paint in 2D, the way you would do this before is you paint this in Photoshop and it would have seams everywhere. You see all, all the seams here, you would have a nasty seam in those areas. And that, that would be incredibly tricky to actually fix unless you're painting in 3D. But a 2D, the UDIMS is basically a 2D version of, or UVs is basically a 2D version of your 3D model. It's it would, the analogy we keep using is kind of like a like a pelted uh, <laughs> like a pelted animal. Yeah. You have a deer. I thought I was going to say human. Or a, or a human. Yeah, the most logical thing would be an animal. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but also like a, it's like a human rug. Yeah. <laughs> you got to turn you got to turn this into a rug, and you got to turn it into a rug where there isn't really any deformation on on the model. So we cover all this in the retopology and the UV tutorial, just how to do all this. But uh, basically, there is. There are a lot of conventions on how to do this, which yeah. will speed up your texturing workflow significantly. So at this point, you now have a model which has all the UVs and everything. Then the next step now is to bring this back into ZBrush. And let's show this. I don't actually think we have an example of this, but let's pretend. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing now is you have the low res base from Maya and which has UVs and topology and everything. But then we have the high res model in ZBrush, which has none of that. What you need to do now, now you need to project the high res onto the low res so that the low res will now have all the subdivision levels and have all the UVs and everything. Because this, again, this is kind of throwaway. You can't really use this for anything directly. Yeah, and this doesn't have our UVs or anything. So getting out any maps is impossible. Yeah. So you get this guy into ZBrush. We have free videos on this as well on how to reproject. Mm. So you get this into ZBrush and then you project the high res onto the low res so that now you, you basically have the same thing where you have a subdivision level up and down up to the same amount of polys yeah. which you can now use to extract displacement maps from and whatever maps you want. And just a little disclaimer here. So oh, every time production is always like this. There's something wrong with your displacement map. 
And, okay, you need to shut up because, <laughs> okay, if you do, okay, we have tons of videos on this. We have, we have written articles about this. Yeah. We've made multiple videos on how to extract your displacement maps correctly in ZBrush that work 100% of the time. Yes. And people have gone back to it like, oh, this doesn't work. Well, it's because you didn't follow every single step. And then you follow every single step and it goes out. So in production, most of the time when, when people say there's something wrong with the displacement map, it's actually not the displacement map that's wrong. Yeah. Because it's, it's actually very hard to mess up uh, extracting a displacement map. Just follow the correct steps and you're all good. So just just keep that in mind. Not that you should use that as ammunition for someone when someone <laughs> says something is wrong with the displacement map and immediately go like, no, it is always perfect. <laughs> it is perfect. But uh, this is a very, very simple set of rules that you need to follow when extracting displacement maps from ZBrush and you'll be good to go every single time. Yes. If your displacement map isn't working, then you're most likely looking at either there's something wrong in the model, there might mm. be some topology things, the reprojection has screwed up like absolutely crazy, <laughs> there is a lot of stretching in UVs, or you have UV smoothing issues, which is a whole separate box of trouble, which we might discuss in a future video. Yeah, I mean, what, who, even, who even knows? Yeah, that's yeah. a tricky one. We uh, do have free videos on how to extract displacement maps from Arnold and uh, V-Ray, yeah. so you can just search for those. But basically, once you have your high-res mesh, you just go into C, C plugin, multi-bam exporter, and you use this, you just use the settings we talk about in the video. Yeah. So now, what you can do is you can, after this, then you'll have a low-res base in um, your render software, which can be Blender, Moto, V-Ray, whatever it is. And now you have high-res displacement maps, which will be rendering on top, which means that you can now render a low-res base, or you can animate a low-res base, but you can get all the sexy details yeah. onto it as um, only during render time, because you can't render this. That's It's just far too heavy. So once you've done all that, texture painting time. <laughs> and, well, you don't have to do that at the same time. You can do that separately. Yeah, like, and usually it's probably handled by someone else. Yeah. It's very rare that you'll take a full character in a bigger production from from all the way through modeling to then texturing and even shading. Yeah. You might do it in games. Yeah. Then it's a bit more, uh, it, it's a bit more, uh, it's a, you have a bit less people in, in, in that. And um, everything we're talking about now is also valid for games. The, the approach is basically exactly the same. Yeah. Instead of doing a displaced map, you would bake a normal map and um, your mesh might be a bit more low res or whatever, but. Yeah, the retopology state, stage might be a little different. There yeah. might be a few more triangles here and there, but it's essentially it. I mean, we're getting very close now with games that you see the, you see the resolution for the hero characters in games. They are very high res now. But they are. Um, and their performance is, is, is really good, so. Yeah. So this is, a, this is a layout we have in uh, Super nice. We we show to do this in the UV mapping series we talked about, where it's it's ready for Painter, and Painter is amazing. Uh, we are going to do a premium tutorial on introduction to it mm -hmm. in the coming future, where we're going to cover how to use everything in Painter. But basically, what we want to show in this video is we just want to show you that you know you're painting in three D. <laughs> We've done this super quick little little base for you, very very rough stuff. But you don't have to worry too much about the layout, the UV layout, because now you can be sure that I'm painting across some seams by just doing this. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter, because you can see here, we yes, we are, did indeed paint across some seams, but it's fine, because we're just painting in 3D. And then you might, you might think to yourself, well, why would I want to use Painter when I already have my mesh in ZBrush and I can just do poly painting in mm. ZBrush? The difference is, here in Painter, you're not, oh, well, there's, there's a lot of differences, but one of the primary differences is here, you're not constricted by your uh, resolution of your mesh. You know, so something like ZBrush works by the resolution of your mesh because it, it paints every vertex. Yeah. So you need more vertices to have a higher resolution mesh. And sometimes you just need to go impossibly high in order to get enough resolution. Whereas with Painter, it's all based on your map size and you know the the size of your your UVs basically, so and also Painter is just so powerful because it's specialized compared to ZBrush. Um, it's the same thing with Mari. You know, Mari yeah. is also specialized software for painting, so you just get you know way more way more out of it if you want to 
sort of take it to the next level, basically. Yeah, one of the cool things about Painter versus painting stuff in ZBrush as well is that it has shaders, like a proper, yeah. proper uh, physically based shader system. You can see here we have more shininess around uh, around the mouth, around uh, the ears and all that. And uh, you can see the lighting is interactive and it, you can see how the reflectivity goes there. You have, we have a lot of bump mapping on it. And doing this in ZBrush is, I mean, yeah, you can get something similar, but you can't really paint spec maps, or roughness maps, or whatever it is, uh, or you can't really have bump maps on top yeah. or anything like this. So this is here you're actually painting the shader. Texturing is is basically just shading. Now, in shading, you're you'll just be defining that you know you have a specular value of this and you have a color value of that. Well, what you're doing now when you're painting it, you're just painting in a value instead. Instead of it's kind of like having a million small little shaders on your model. With different I, ideally, ideally, all the all the shading, in my opinion, should be handled in texturing. Yeah. You know, you you want to have a software like this or in Mari where you have a representative shader of what whatever you're using in the company. So when the texture artist is texturing, they can see what does it actually look like. Um, I I think the role of a shading artist uh, should just be to plug in the the textures, the the less tweaking that the shading artist has to do, the better I think, yeah. because it makes it just more. It's easier to update. You know, if if you get an update from a, a texture artist and the shading artist had has done a bunch of stuff with nodes and corrected colors, it makes it very hard to update the the textures down the line. Yeah, exactly. This is a shading artist. It's also called a looktive artist. Mm -hmm. And in film, this has traditionally been done by two separate people. But but right now, it's merging more together. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons it has been by two separate people is has been due to lack of technology because you haven't had access to tools like this. You know, you couldn't paint no. the spec and the bump at the same time. But that that's changing now. So the way I, I, I think it should be reconsidered isn't texturing and shading or whatever you call it. It should just be a surfacing artist. What you're defining now is just a surface. You're defining how shiny is it, how much bump does it have, it does is there is there subsurface scattering on it or whatever yeah. it is. It, basically, it all boils down to what happens when light hits a surface and what is the surface made of, and um, that that simplifies it a lot for me. Texturing is a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is a uh, this is where I can just sit for days and just paint. Particularly in Painter, Mari is used a lot in the industry as well. Particularly in film, it's not used a lot in in, in games. There might be some for some hero assets here and there, because you do have more control in it. But for a lot of your texture needs, Painter is going to be perfectly sufficient for it. Mari is a must-have if you are doing film though, just because you at least for characters of film, because you are going this close to it. And like we said, you need UDIMs. Here you can see that. <laughs> nice. You can see that, you know, it gets, you, you just run out of resolution at some point. You just can't get too close to something like this. Yeah. And then, you know, again, what we said is, you know, you just increase the, the texture resolution to, you know, 4K, 8K, whatever, but you just can't keep doing it. So then you need UDIMs. You need, you need this entire thing to be 8K because you are going this close up to it. And you also have a lot more you have a lot more power in Mari as well compared to Painter, where you you know you can have. We worked on movies where you have like 120 UDIMs 4K, <laughs> and I mean Mari doesn't run great, but it runs okay. Yeah. Here in Painter currently we're running like one 2K map. Yeah, and the difference is also in terms of hardware. Now on this machine yeah. we have a 980 uh, GTX 980 Ti, which is you know it's a high end gaming graphics card, but it runs really well yeah. with Painter. Even that graphics card kind of struggles in Mari, just because it's not it's not really made for it. It doesn't have enough RAM. If you want the so like top of the line performance in Mari, you have to go out and spend like five thousand pounds on a graphics card. Yeah, that's what we had. Which I don't I don't need, how, how much RAM do they even have? I think we're, I think I had twenty four gigs on the one I, I used for. Yeah, like on a graphics for card. For the movie. I think normal graphics card, like if you have like mid to high high end, to have like four. Two or four gigs of yeah. RAMs or something like that. Yeah, so crazy. there's a pretty big difference in performance there. So that's another thing to keep in mind, which is also why I think Painter is so accessible to people. Yeah, Painter is Painter is really nice, uh, and we're getting more and more into it. After I've been using primarily Mari for some years now, but but it doesn't really matter. This is an interface yeah. for for shading. When I'm getting into Painter now, and you know, I've still been using it for for some time now, but now that I'm getting seriously into it, it's just an interface. 
I just got to learn where is the brush? Yeah. Where is the thing? What texturing is, is really just, like we said before, it's really just defining the surface and what happens when light hits the surface. Once you understand that and have a deeper understanding of how texturing works, then if you can paint in any software. You can go to body paint if you yeah, want exactly. still texture. So <laughs> If you're super hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> so once all that is done, then you are going to be rendering. You can render in basically whatever render engine you're going to be using. In, uh, it's pretty cool in... Um, and Painter, you have iRay. Yeah, I'm really a big fan of iRay. iRay is, um, we've used it for our lighting scene as mm. well, actually, the flip normals lighting scene. What I've done when, often when we've had to do product shots, instead of actually rendering them, I've just taken in the flip normals HDRIs, just thrown them into Painter with iRay and just it's shaded it in there. Just because it's so interactive and it's so fast. Yeah, because it's uh, a real render engine. Yeah, like so. this isn't in uh, in Painter. It's real time, or with the default interface, it's it's real time. But uh, but this is not real time. This is this is a proper. This is ray traced. Yeah. This is proper rendering. So if you were to render it as an Arnold as well, or whatever is might you might be using, mm -hmm. it would basically look the same yep. as as it does there. So once you have your character and you know you you retopologized you painted it. You export out your shaders, and then you plug them into a render engine, and that can be it. Can basically every single three D software has a render engine, and it might they might use the same render engine. Like you have V-Ray available for a bunch of different software, mm -hmm. today, like Modo, Max, Maya, probably Cinema Four D, and all of them. Yeah. So that's basically a a render engine will just compute everything and just will just render a single image like this. So. Those are basically the steps for doing a character. Yeah. You know, to recap here, you know, you start with you start with concept sculpting, then you retopologize it. Reason you retopologize it is because of performance. You can't animate that at <laughs> all. And also it makes it a lot easier to to texture later on as well. Then you UV map your character, which is a flat representation of your 3D forms. Then you paint super nice maps. <laughs> like, not like this. You paint better maps than this. And then you um, you do that in something like Substance Painter or Photoshop, whatever you prefer. It doesn't yeah. matter. You export all your maps into a render engine, and then you render from there. And in between those steps, you have more specialized you know, uh, positions, like you have rigging, for example. Yes. And there's also animation. On top of that, you can have something like Groom. After, after you're done with your character to add fur and hair, you might have effects on top as well. Yeah. So... But these are these are all the steps for you know the the primary steps for a character artist that wants to take their character all the way through. Yeah, this is how to make the asset for it. We'll yeah. talk more about the pr overall production later on, mm. where we do cover not so much this is how you read top, but more uh, what comes before and after, what yeah. is lighting, all these steps. So if you have questions about this, about uh, the character process, if you have specific ideas for videos you want us to do on this both more long-term premium ones or shorter ones yeah. just to clear something up, let us know in the comments and uh, we'll get back to you on that. And if you want to see more content like this in the future, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you. Thanks, guys.